Maybe you're in another plane. Maybe you're tuning in from Mechanus or... God, my second edition Planescape lore nerd brain just totally failed me on that one. Um, Acheron. Yeah, let's say Acheron. That's a good one. Uh, hi, Wow Dad. Wow Dad. <laughs> Thanks for the sub. Bytopia? Yes. Fucking sweet. God, Bytopia is a fun thing to say. Also, it makes me think of a place where the bisexuals live happily together forever. Bytopia. Yes, bed can be another realm. I'm good with that. Welcome. Wherever, whatever extra planar abyss you're from, uh, you're welcome. You're welcome here. Thank you. Just another muffin. Welcome back. Ash. Here we go. Watch, here it comes. There it is. So, returns. let's talk about what's going on here, um, faithful Bitopians. Um, so, you, you may find yourself confused because uh, I did that thing where I said that the game in category were Dungeons and & Dragons. And this is D&D adjacent. I don't feel that bad about choosing this as my category. Um, this is a, a, a prep session in the sense that I'm going to be prepping something. <laughs> Hi, Caitlin. Um, I'm, I'm prepping something. Now, it's not game prep in the traditional, like, I'm building a dungeon and populating it with monsters. We're going to be talking a little bit about lore and what have you, but the reason that I'm doing this stream is because I've been working on, in fits and starts, and I will show you how little I actually have written down when we get started, but I've been working mentally in fits and starts on a micro version of... A micro version of a Court of Swords tabletop RPG. Okay? So you might say to yourself, but Adam, you're already playing Court of Swords. Is not Court of Swords already a campaign setting for 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons? And I will say to you, yes. Yes, it is. It certainly is. But you know me, I hope, and if you don't, let me tell you a little something about what I believe about tabletop role-playing games. I believe the mechanisms of the role-playing game define the narrative thereof. And if we want to tell stories about murdering monsters and getting treasure in the world of Court of Swords, Dungeons & Dragons is going to be a great jam. We're, we're doing fine. I'm having a good time. It's all about that, that TPK. It's all about that... that Mimic full of mimics. What I want to do is I want to build a game. I was going to say from scratch, but I'm going to be stealing stuff from, from better designers than me. But the idea here is I want to build a game that allows us to tell Court of Swords stories the way I would like to tell them if we were free of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, that sounds like Dungeons and Dragons has me, you know, tied to a post somewhere and is making me play with it. But it's not. That's not how it's going. It's just that D&D is allowing me to, uh, to tell certain types of story, and that's cool. But I want to I wanna explore something different. I want to give the world of Court of Swords a little bit of room to breathe and to do some different stuff that isn't just getting XP and gathering treasure. So let's talk about what makes a role-playing game that's just a big it's a big question what goes what what goes into a role-playing game what what do role-playing games have in common with one another what makes a role-playing game be about what it's about now i've talked in numerous times about the three questions and again if you've watched office hours if you listen to me talk about game design you know that that these things are important to me. Um, but I tend to use them to help me understand existing games and help me think about answering them as I build my game. So the three questions uh, brought to us by uh, the, the author of Inspectors and, and general decent human being and game designer, uh, Jared Sorensen, uh, are as follows. What is your game about? In what ways is your game about that? What are the players of your game rewarded for doing? Those three things will give us a baseline understanding of any role-playing game. 
You can also use them as a good way to tell if a role-playing game is going to help you accomplish what it sets out to accomplish or if it's just going to kind of be adjacent to it. So, I want to make a game that is about the connection of its characters to their fate, to each other, and to the world cosmology. I want a game that's about, like, adventure-type stuff, right? I want the characters in this to be about fighting monsters sometimes, if they have to. I want them to be about fighting other humans sometimes. I, I want them to have the ability to survive in a dangerous universe. I want them to be hard dogs. I want them to be able to survive in a, in a world that is dangerous. I want to carry that forward. That's something about Court of Swords that I love. I want the world to feel deadly, and I want these characters to be equipped to fight their way out of or through that deadliness. But I want to fill in the other stuff around it, and I don't want to fill it in with D&D stuff necessarily. Uh, I want to do away with fiddly shit like movement rate. I want this to be about oh, telling stories the about these returns. things. Um, Welcome home. What's up, K2? Welcome back. Uh, I want to... I want to tell stories about violence. I don't want to play a tactical miniatures game about violence. Um, I want to express a narrative of an uncaring world. Uh, I want to... Uh, I want to see characters in this game fight with the things that are trying to destroy them and the things they care about, and I want them to care about each other. Um... And I want it to feel like a, a variation of Court of Swords, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a couple of games that are inspiring me when I think about this. In fact, this originally started as a conceptual hack of a game called World of Dungeons. What's up, Wolf Wizard? So World of Dungeons is a demake by John Harper of Dungeon World. Uh, we released it with the Dungeon World Kickstarter as kind of a joke. The idea that we found it in a box somewhere from 1975 and that it it's the prequel version. It's the it's the joke was that it's like the Moldvay or the Holmes to our uh, current Dungeon World. So what it does is it boils down a lot of Apocalypse Engine stuff to a single mechanism and a bunch of modifiers to that mechanism. Um, it basically makes every move defy danger, uh, but allows you the space to make your own moves. So it's a great place to start if you're like me and not really interested in coming with a brand new conflict mechanism. I also think it's a good fit because I quite like the trouble leads to trouble, right? The destruction and chaos and forward momentum of sort of ablative character that happens uh, as you move through a narrative that uses these rules, right? The mechanisms of a game indicate the kind of narrative that the game is about. And the 2d6 plus a stat, 7 to 9, minus 6, 10 or better thing does a specific kind of narrative that I think for now I'm interested in. I might go back and redesign the entire underling section. I might pull all that mechanic stuff out and throw it away. But for now, it gives me a good base to stand on. So I'm going to do that. We're going to start there. I'm going to crib some stuff from some other games that I like. We'll see where we can make them fit. Uh, I haven't really thought at all about the GMing stuff, but I would love to have a front X faction turn grand scale something or other that we can give to the GM. I also want it to not be reliant on a monster manual. Uh, I want only to give tools for creating adversaries, right? Statting them out. I want them to be really simple. Um, I want a freeform magic system. I don't want to use spell lists. I want, um, I want spell casters all to be very similar because they're lore stuff. And I don't know, maybe, maybe I want, 
maybe I want some kind of like corruption mechanism. I don't know. I don't know yet. Face cake. Welcome back. Thank you for returning to subscribe with your Twitch Prime sub. Second month Twitch Prime subs are the hardest fucking thing to do in the world. I keep forgetting mine. So, all right. Let's take a look at the shitty notes that I have. Would you like to see my shitty notes? Okay. So these used to be in a note file on my phone. And, and I, I recently to the mouth. I recently just uh, d dumped them uh, into... Uh, I recently just dumped them into a Google Doc so you could see them. Uh, Bundy B, welcome to the squad. Thank you very much. Let's take a look at what we got. Here's some shitty, some shitty notes. This is the beginning of a role-playing game. So, this is my my World of Dungeons X Court of Swords. Uh, you will note that there's a bunch of just like bullshit questions on here, like core resolution mechanism, S stat gen, pregante, inventory like blades. So let's go through what I've got so far. So these are these are gonna stay crappy. One thing that made this possible for me, let me let me talk to you about about my greatest hurdle when I'm making a role playing game. My greatest hurdle is that I do not have InDesign skills to transfer something like this bullshit into something that looks good enough to play test. So usually I just don't bother because I have other shit to do and I'm scared. So what's cool is that I can publish this via the roleplay zine and Daniel will lay it out for me. <laughs> so, let's talk about what I do have and what I am pretty into. So right now, the core resolution mechanism of this game, if we steal directly from if we steal directly from, from John's game, from World of Dungeons, this is the core resolution mechanism, right? When you need to accomplish something Welcome to the math whose outcome is uncertain. <gasps> Belkinsa, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. When you need to accomplish something whose outcome is uncertain, roll plus the appropriate stat on a... Less than less than six, you don't do it, and a bad thing happens to you. On a seven to nine, you do it, but the GM will tell you some additional cost or complication. On a ten plus, you do the thing. Done, right? This this is the core resolution mechanism. This right here is the game, right? And yeah, we can, we can, we'll, we'll tailor these words. Don't get too hung up on the way I'm phrasing this stuff. But basically this is all I'm, this is all I'm thinking about for the core resolution mechanism. Now I could do this a totally different way. We could do a D6 dice pool. We could say, get a number of D6 is equal to your stat and a skill. Uh, every six that you get, you need one six to succeed. Multiple sixes give you additional bonuses. Check your skills for what bonuses you get, right? That, that could be, that's a system. That's um, Tales from the Loop and Coriolis. Uh, I could do... Um, the DM will give you a target number, uh, draw a card and add to it one of your stats. The number that you get has to be higher than the, right? Like there's, there's a million different ways to kind of like fuck around with this. I don't care right now. This is not the part that I am that excited about. We could say fuck numbers altogether and we could give players a, a pool of points to spend. So the more you care about something, the more you spend points. Return. Uh, Duncor, welcome back. Exit at Midnight, also welcome back. Thank you for hanging out and doing this thing. So the reason, okay, so here's the thing. The reason why the core resolution mechanism matters, this is why it actually means something, is because it's about certainty, right? Now, let's, let's look at those three options I just gave. So one, core resolution mechanism like this, if I say you roll plus your stat, it's a fairly, fairly even curve. If you have a plus three, you've got a much better understanding that you're going to succeed than if you have a plus zero, right? You can you can usually, at a glance, guess whether you're going to be successful or not, right? Not complicated, fairly straightforward. If you have between minus three and plus three, and you are drawing a card that gives you between 
zero and one, well, one in 10, that's a massive chaos plateau, right? You could get anywhere as low as say like four with your plus three or 13. So it's just this like massive, massive gap. The least uncertain is a bidding mechanism, right? Like in Undying or like in Amber saying, I have 10 points and I'm going to, in secret, pick some points and then, ha, reveal them. And if I beat whoever I'm, and then I have to come up with a pool for the GM. How does that pool get fed? Is it like a, uh, a doom pool that feeds every time the characters do something? Whatever. Anyway, I'm not sure right now what kind of core resolution mechanism that I want, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter right now because I can think about instead all of the other stuff that goes into building the game. I can talk about the reward system. I can talk about the other mechanisms that I'm interested in. So let's let's do that, right? Let's let's start with that stuff. So what I'm thinking well, is if we're going to let's assume we're going to stick with this core resolution mechanism. Um Welcome to the squad. Let's see if I can try to pronounce your name. Hios Delarol. That's my guess. That is my guess. <laughs> okay. So let's let's talk about what, what is in the game. I'll talk about how tarot fits in in a second. Okay. So these were the stats that I was thinking of. Um, if we go with that, um, that the characters are divided into things they do with their mind things they do with their body, things they feel with their heart, and then a, a, a fourth mysterious entity called the soul. Um, part of this is the, the set of fours that's built into the, into the setting of the game. Welcome to the math squad. DJ Van Pelt, thank you. Um, so that, that, you know, these, these are the four that I think. I think that a human, uh, human being or, or whatever species, whatever people, uh, think of themselves as having a mind, a heart, a body, and a soul. Uh, now, we could throw in another one like like Void or whatever, but I don't know what it would cover. These are how do the characters accomplish their goals using those things. Pairing up with those, um, there are the alignments. And I, I was thinking the alignments are like in Dungeon World. To the math squad. Bon Dougal. Welcome to the squad. Thank you. Like in, like in Blades, if you expressed your alignment... You get experience at the end. This is this is Blades. This is Dungeon World. Um, and the alignments are just like we're using now. Uh, fire, Earth, Air, Water, and Void. Um, now, yeah, we could go with swords, wands, coins, and cups. But they are already... Fire is already associated with wands. Earth is already associated with coins. Air is already associated with swords. And water with cups. And then void is the is the the third. I want I want void to be there as your character is is a bad luck. Your character is an ill omen, uh, and that's that's your jam. Now I like the idea of the characters being fundamentally broken up into classes, but also I want to give you the ability to make your own class. This is again ripped right from from World of Dungeons, and so you might remember if you follow me on Twitter, I was asking some questions about naming these things. You'll pick your class first, and then your subclass second. So for example. Armament and fortitude are the skills of the warrior. If you're a warrior, you are either a monk, a soldier, an ardent, or a brute. If you're a monk, you're also disciplined and acrobatic. If you're a soldier, you have command and tactics. If you're an ardent, you have smite and inquisit. I was going to call that scroot, but... And if you're a brute, you have rend and rage. Now, if you want to, you can be a warrior that has discipline and rage... Right? This could be like a, a warrior of balance, right? A yin and yang situation. If you want to be a warrior that has command and inquisit, you could be a, uh, 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 an inquisitor with uh, a holy uh, cadre. Um, yes, exactly, uh, Mads. You could be a warrior that has both uh, a brute who has scroot. But the idea here is... Yeah, I give you some presets. They're each, they each give you some skill stuff, and then you can mix and match them. Um, not awful. Living up to your name. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, so that's that. Magicians have mysticism and oracle to represent mysticism, which is to say their connection 
to the magic of the world and Oracle that they can use to tell the future using the tarot, right? Though every, every magician has that. Now you might be a scholar, which gives you spellcraft and occultism. Spellcraft being the codified ritualistic casting of spells. Occultism being, you know about occultic, like cultish things in the world. You know about the, the hidden darkness in the world. Secret knowledge, right? You could be a sorcerer and sorcerers have an ability called fountain craft, right? Fountain craft is the ability to tap directly in to the fountain's power in the universe. Right. This is I draw on the force. Right. And then sixth sense, which allows you to perceive the flows of the fountain in the in the world around you. Uh, you can be a priest. Priests have ceremony and prayer ceremony being uh, social stuff. Right. The ability to to gather other faithful together. Uh, this is ceremony of the arcana. These are very much a modern creation. Um, and then prayer, which is basically um, priest magic, right? Um, the idea that through your prayer, uh, you gain access to the fountain by way of the multiple facets of the, the arcana, right? And then lastly, shamans. Shamans conjure spirits. You can call gods down from heaven, call up nature spirits from the earth. Spirit binding is a big inspiration here. And then you can sacrifice. Sacrifice is turning a physical object into an empowering force for your magic and for the spirits that you are conjuring. Some shamans conjure spirits of the dead, some conjure uh, spirits of, of earth, that kind of stuff. So those are the four sort of spell casting facets, but they're all magicians, right? They all pull from the same source. They just don't realize it. And that's, again, that's very, um, that's very like mage, uh, right? In the way that it, in the way that it works. Um, and then you can be a rogue. All rogues, murder and deceive, right? I don't care if you're a thief, an assassin, a ranger, or a vagabond, you are bad news and your shit is murder and deception. Now keep in mind, that's different from say, command and rend and rage, but you could theoretically be a rogue that has rage. We'll, we'll work that out. But anyway, all rogues are liars and murderers. What kind of liar and murderer are you? You could be a thief. Now I want to crime and burglary feel too similar because burglary is a crime. So I wanted to I wanted to come up with something for for burglary. But the idea here is crime, which covers picking pockets, opening locks, doing all kinds of like bad thiefy type shit. Um, maybe we should call this one like underworld or something. Um, it's your connection to the criminal world. Uh, I'm gonna just call it I don't know underworld connection. Something like that. Um, Skulking and sneaking and, and all that bullshit can fall under crime. But if you take a look, some rogues are assassins. And assassins poison and stalk, right? They murder and deceive because they are rogues, deceptive murderers who poison and stalk. Nasty, nasty business. Rangers... Now, the idea, the idea here about all of these people are deceptive murderers. So let's change. I'm going to change Ranger. I'm changing it because I want all rogues to be outcasts uh, of some kind. So let's, let's actually just call this outcast. So outcasts have wild calling and woodcraft. They are people who have been uh, cast out from society and who have lived in the wilds and who can call upon nature. Maybe they've, they've got an animal companion they call on. Uh, and then woodcraft is woodcraft, right? They can survive. It's like a survival skill, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then lastly, uh, vagabond, right? And vagabonds, I added connections because I think that you are, vagabonds are like um, hobos. Um, they are people who who live out, uh, like like outcasts, they're, they're in casts, right? They, uh, they have connections in the underworld, but not in the same way that thieves do. This is the like, they know a guy. Um, just from hearing things, uh, maybe like rumor craft is better there. I don't know how specific I want to, I want these to be. Um, and then ingenuity is like, um, ingenuity is their, their skill at like MacGyvering basically. And we'll, we'll mechanically define these better. Um, but yeah, the connections and the underworld connection thing, I need to, I need to clear those up. Um, yeah, like an ear to the ground. 
something like that. Yeah, let's here. Why don't we call it? Um, what did I call? What did I say before? Rumor, like rumor mongering or rumor wise, something like that. <laughs> Scuttlebutt. See now, because all rogues are murderers and deceivers, um, I don't want any nice sounding stuff, right? I don't want the thieves to have mischief. I don't want them to be scoundrels. Um, I want them to be murderers and deceivers. They are they are bad people. Rumorcraft. That's what I called it. Yeah, I think that's too much like woodcraft. I think rumormonger is good. I think that's fine. Hearsay. Hearsay is a nice one. That's good. Okay. All right, let's not get too hung up on the on the nomenclature. But yes, a vagabond is a murder hobo. Exactly. This is a D&D character. Welcome All the other ones have a place in the world, but Outcast and Vagabonds are D&D characters. Hearth Daughter, thank you for your prime sub. Welcome. Yeah, not Han Solo. Bad people. Um, let's change uh, I'm going to change Woodcraft to like they're poachers right now you can be robin hood but we're not seeing robin hood through his own eyes we're seeing robin hood through the eyes of structure this is the court of swords right so our point of view on all of these characters and all of their actions everything that they do is through society's lens yeah cartel Something like that. Yeah. Well, again, don't let's not get hung up. We're getting hung up on the wrong shit. Let's carry on. Okay. So this is how I'm going to structure the classes. I haven't decided if you pick, like, you have to be a warrior, a magician, or a rogue. And then you can mix and match within those. Or maybe you could just make your own, like, have armament and mysticism. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Uh, okay. So. I was thinking the reason why you'd want that is because if we do blade style inventory, every warrior, magician, and rogue has... Okay, let's talk about blade style inventory. Um, killer tick. Hello, hello. Um, so, so blades style uh, inventory is you get a list of things that your character could potentially have on you at any time, and then when you go into doing something you well there you 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 get, pick your equipment from a potential list every time you don't make a clear list and I, I like that I want the characters to be flexible I don't like the idea of carrying over from D&D &D the like thing that you just end up having on your list because you you thought you might need it um also I will I will point out I will point out Ferrisar there is a fourth option right you could be a warrior, you could be a magician, you could be a rogue, or you could go your own way and, and embrace the void and make your own class, right? It's the unstated fourth. Um, so the, yeah, in the, the inventory system would have to have a refresh point. Uh, there would be, there would be something, something that says now is the time to re-equip. Um, again, structural play stuff. We don't have to get to that. One thing I want to, I want to talk about while we do this is you don't have to decide every tiny little thing as you move through it. You, you can flag these things as like later I'll make a system to fit into this, right? As you design, you write a piece of stuff, highlight something as being like, oh, I'm going to need this mechanism, then design that mechanism later and you can come back to it. You don't have to do it all in order, right? Fuck all the stuff. I don't, we don't even have a core mechanism yet. doesn't matter. It doesn't fucking matter. Just like progress, forward, motion. All right. So I'm stealing something from, from, from Vincent here from, I think, Apocalypse World Dark Age. Uh, I don't like hit points for this, this thing I'm trying to do. I like narrative bloodshed. And these are a series of checkboxes that tell you how close to being dead you are. Peckable Dan, welcome. So if you have nothing checked, you are healthy. Or maybe there's like the first box is always checked, right? I am hale and hearty. Now, I just made a bunch of lists. I don't know. I'd have to play test what this stuff was going to be. But the idea here is each time you take a wound, you check the, uh, the next box, right? So when someone asks you, oh, that goblin stabbed you in the leg. To the math squad. Stamper. Welcome to the squad. When someone stabs you in the leg, you can say, ah, my wounds are beginning to show. 
or I'm staggered, slowed and weakening. Death lurks, close at hand, right? The idea here is your character would describe themselves as suffering from these things. And so part of the things that hurt the players will tell you how many boxes to check. A, a minotaur with, uh, with a battle axe might demand you check four boxes when struck, right? So it is, shh, don't tell anybody, it's still hit points. It's totally still hit points, don't tell anybody. So, you know, it's like a harm clock, which is also hit points also still hit points and when you reach that last box i die that's it you are killed um so i mean we could re we could reorganize these we could talk about them we could say they're they're um like uh we we could use more or less we could create uh we could create a new one that says uh uh, my resurrection is nigh. Uh, I, re I rejoin the cycle. Right? We can flavor these however we want. Um, and, that's, and that's a thing, right? And recovery will tie into these. Uh, all of this stuff. They're basically just how badly fucked up your character is. Um, now, this is a good question. Uh, stress track. Mental strain. Some kind of UA type thing. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we need that. We'll see. We'll see. But this this is this is the thing. All right? Now let's talk about XP because this is the thing that I, I sunk the most time into so far. Figuring out because okay, let me tell you about let me tell you about a let me tell you about a pet peeve of mine. Let me tell you about a pet peeve. So I don't like when I don't like when game systems include the tarot but only the major arcana. Yeah, I get it. The tarot is big, but if you're going to use it, fucking use it. Don't be scared. Don't don't just make the top ones. Make it important. Put some shit in there. So, yeah, I went through and I figure the plan here is just like we do now. You draw a card, you draw one card for each of your companions, and now you have an XP trigger. So to gain XP in the game, so far, express your alignment, draw tarot cards. Draw tarot cards, express your alignment. It's only a lot because it's a big table. You don't ever have to look at the whole thing. Like, why, why, would, why would this ever be, I don't, like... I think that this is fine. This is just, it's a table from which to draw a card. You're only going to have three or four of these. So there you go. This is, this is a thing from the game. And all, all it does, because they're all, they're all sort of functional, right? Really, what we're looking at is four sets of, four sets of a few, a few options, right? Like, if it's about cups, it's emotional. If it's about wands, it's about ideas. If it's coins, it's about practical shit. And if it's swords, it's about action. So ideas and action might be switched there. I can never remember. But anyway, the, the point here is that an ace is an ace is an ace, right? Like the ace of cups is about uh, starting something emotional. The ace of wands is about new ideas. Uh, Etc. Right. So the idea here is that that really these are just behavioral triggers, and this gives me the opportunity to place in the game exciting things that set up your relationship to your character, uh, to the other characters outside of your own desire. Because again, you are uh, you are fortune's fool. You don't get to decide what the gods want you to do. Right. The gods want you to betray your companions like if you and your best friend your best friend in the whole fucking world like boon companion desperately in 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 the deepest loyalty to one another if you go to the fortune teller and the fortune teller draws a three of swords one of you is fated to betray the other now you can spend your whole life avoiding your fate you can never gain experience but it's much easier just to embrace it and find an opportunity to betray your companion before he betrays you. Right? So that's that's how that's how these work. They're not they're they're external. They're about again, remember what I said about what I want the game to be about. I want it to be about not particularly having free will in the constraints of your alignment 
and your uh and and your fate by by your by your drawing of the card. And I think that these things you draw them and and yeah, I don't know when we I don't know when we we do them again. You know, I don't know the re the regularity with which we draw a new thing. Um, I'm looking at my phone because there was a graphic that didn't uh, that didn't make it in here. I did some some drawing um, and it didn't copy over, so I'm just gonna check what I had there and I'll we'll we'll codify it that way. Okay, so uh, I made notes about how to differentiate between the subclasses, which I which we did a little bit of. What does advancement look like in the whole larger reward model? Oh yeah, race. Right. Here's how I want to split. Here's how I want to split race. Because I think race in D&D &D is stupid. Um, I want to give you two separate things uh, to play with. So let's let's do that. Um, these are going to be called... Um, not alignment. There was another thing. Or some not so D&D &D term for it. I'll figure that out later. Okay. So instead of race, instead of race, we have... Um, Instead of race, we have a uh, kin and culture. So kin, uh, attunement. Yeah, I think that's what it was. Because you get this when you're born. Your character doesn't pick this. Uh, you are you are born with this, and you may not think you're a fire, but you're a fucking fire, right? Like in in our world, when we say, "Oh, you're such a Scorpio," we're just talking out our ass. In the world of Court of Swords, if someone says to you, oh, what sign are you? And you're like, oh, I'm an Earth. They can make some specific judgment calls about your personality. Now, people are broad, and, and there's lots of ways to be an Earth sign, but you're all, you all do actually share that stuff. In this universe, this, this is like the Zodiac, and it's real. So kin and culture, your kin are the people to whom you are related by blood. So these are blood ties. Uh, biological connection to a species. Okay. So in this case, we're talking about things like, uh, I made a list of all the things, I made a list of all the things that, that are in the, that are in the, uh, that have been in the game so far. <gasps> Macaluso, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, so what do we, what did I, I made a list. I was here. It was like human. Let me know, Court of Swords folks, if I am missing something okay so human dwarf halfling uh tianxi uh kenku uh forest gnome yuanti uh janasi uh half work and I think that's all we've seen on the show so far. Am I missing anything? Did I miss any of the PCs we've had? I want to make sure we cover these, and then I'll add in more. Um, Tianxi R. Asimar. Yeah, we haven't. No, see, we haven't had. We haven't had any. Um, it implies orc. Yeah. Uh, I think for our game, so now I'm going to make some changes. Uh, I'm going to make some changes. I, I, I think. I think orc, instead of half orc. Um, I think gnome, I don't want to talk about like sub biologically, uh, other different kinds of orc or different kinds of dwarf are not, they're not different. Um, they're, they're, they're more like, yeah, I don't, I don't want them to be that different. We'll talk about culture in a second. So Kenku, I'm changing back to Tengu because that's where the, originally it came from. Um, gnome, I need like the name of... Let me let me see. Like what I need like a gnome equivalent in uh Chinese mythology um or like one of the one of the cultures like gnome is very european. Um so gnome equivalent in like helpful kind of like helpful house house spirits. Uh I want to move completely away. I want to move completely completely away from um from the the stuff that we're you know working on like halfling uh i need a new name for it. it's too it's I, they're vestigial D, D things yeah you know what i'm gonna cut halflings i'm gonna make halflings and gnomes the same 
or not the same, but we're going to roll them into one species. Um, so I'm going to just put a, I'm going to put a, uh, we'll do this. Gnome replacement. And then one T I need snake people. Uh, Genasi. I need like, um, Jin. I think, I mean, I think that's a thing. They're from everywhere though. So they're like elemental. So I need a good name for them. Orc. I guess, or no, Orc is Oni. There we go. Okay, so this is where this is where we'll start. Oh, Naga. Yeah, Naga makes a lot of sense for snake people. Yep. That's a good that's a good start. So I'll just do some I'll just do some some searching. Kozaru. Kozaru wa nandasu The problem is there's no Japan. So the more we steal, the more we steal from Japan. Like I need I need a new name for Oni too. Oh, Kozaru is just a Yeah, Ma Magwais are Magwai are goblins. Uh, we've seen them. I think they're a distinct. I don't know. Maybe they shouldn't be. Maybe they should be Mogwai. I like that. Mogwai. Okay. And then we just need one for elemental. And Oni, I'm gonna I'm gonna change it to like ogre. Um. And let's see if the Chinese mythology has, because the quarter coins is the the defining cultural force. Let's see. Tao T. Oh, Tao T is both one of the four evil fiends and a motif in Chinese. Tao T might be good. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Again, we don't need to get caught up on names. So, ogre, elemental, touched. Yeah. Yeah, and Tengu, Tengu is is Japanese too. So we need we need like birdmen. All right, so I'll I'll look those up and I'll just use we'll use the the name from uh, from a, a mythology uh, that if the fits our, our our setting. Sorry, Ash, my my Chinese pronunciation isn't good because I don't speak Mandarin or Cantonese and have never had any need or use for it. <laughs> I'm sure that my my Danish is also really bad. Um, we'll figure it out. Okay. Uh, and then culture. So you choose, you choose your kin, um, but you also choose your, your culture and they may be different. And culture is a bit like, uh, your background. Um, it's the type of culture you came from. So not like human culture, dwarven culture, uh, you're going to mix and match these. So I was thinking the types of culture would be, uh, urban uh, rural, monastic, um, nomadic, military, solitary, which is to say no culture. Um, these are, these are types of, these are types of cultures and they exist. They exist in all the courts pretty much. Um, so yeah, you could be a dwarf from an urban culture. You could be a Tianxi from a military culture. Um, yeah, monastic is yeah, something that covers like learning, but I guess that would be like a, a raised in a library, um, which I guess is possible, certainly. Um, and then I also want one to represent uh, like heaven, like you were raised. Um, Ooh, I know, I know one. Um, there, there's also um, like uh, not punitive, um, penal, and divine. Yeah, I was thinking celestial, but I also it's a game about like it's a game inspired by uh, Earth, Eastern mythology, and I don't like the idea of using um, celestial to describe anything. So we're just gonna, just gonna avoid that word, if it's at all possible. So, the idea here is that you are, uh, if you're a, if you're a, uh, uh, say a slave, like Berg would be. So again, this is this is another way for us to indicate that we're we're succeeding. Uh, we should be able to use 
these, uh, we should be able to use these to figure out the characters in the game. So like Berg obviously is a, is a brute, right? He's a warrior. He's a brute and he has a penal culture and he's an ogre in our, in our setting. Um, if, uh, if we look at Enoch, uh, Enoch is a human from an urban culture. Uh, he's a warrior, has armament and fortitude. And I think he probably took command and I don't know what else. We never really got to like, we haven't learned what he's any good at. Um, Cezius, so, uh, way, way, way back when, when people liked to have sort of vaguely racist ways of referring to people, um, anyone from the mysterious Orient, uh, celestial is a, uh, an even more racist way of saying Oriental to describe a person. <laughs> John Wayne. Yeah. So we'll, we'll talk about. I guess the third thing maybe would be like profession. Uh, and the reason why I might want profession is this might like in DCC cover all the bullshit you're good at on a non violent, non exploratory D and D type level. Right? So, if you said my profession is I was a noble, you could basically roll and uh, and and have a, have the right to make a roll around anything dealing with your uh, your profession. Anything a noble would be good at. Um, yeah, it's a really old timey way of being racist to people from Asia, <laughs> like really old timey. Um, yeah. So just a just just a thought. Right? Profession. This is a maybe. This is a big old, I don't know if I want to include this or not, but we could figure that out. We can make a list of these things. Um, well, and so the, the, the given here, uh, Sith Master, is when you pick a profession, you explain why you are, um, you explain why you're uh, not that anymore. Right? So... You, you explain your downfall. You explain to us why you are not allowed to do the thing that you're good at. And instead, you've had to turn to this at this dark life. Because this game, as with the world of Court of Swords, as with, as with Torchbearer, uh, I want it to believe that adventurers are trash. Adventurers are a bunch of, like, trash fuck-ups. Um, they're, not, they're not good people who fit into society. They're, they're broken. They're broken weirdos. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know how this is going to work yet mechanically, but these are some things. So, so now what do we do? Now what do we do? Now we got to design this fucking game. We've got some like loose horse shit. How do we... Build this into uh, into a game, right? What needs fleshing out? So, if this is our core resolution mechanism, how do we generate mind, heart, body, and soul? Right? Do we do an array? Do we make you roll? What what matters here? I think I think an array makes the most sense because it's not we're not doing D and D. You don't roll for stats. We could also say drawing drawing cards. So let's let's so again this this to reinforce the fate thing, we can you have to kind of have a tarot deck to play this game. So let's do a thing with tarot. So how about your array is defined by your tarot, right? I wonder if we could do a thing that's about like how many let me get okay, hold on. I gotta get my tarot cards. <laughs> I need a I need a deck on hand. Okay, so what do we have on a what do we have on a tarot card? We have uh, 
we have numbers, right? Each major and minor card is a number, sort of. Uh, we have four. Uh, we have four suits uh, of cards, right? Um, so we could say. Yeah, like for attunement, that's really easy, right? So let me let me draw one. Your character, I drew the Queen of Cups. Bam, water, right? You drew. See, but then I drew the Hermit. What does that mean? Right, Hermit is not elementally aligned. Um, if you do an array, it could be like. If you draw a major arcana, you choose. Like, let, let's imagine. Let's imagine this. Let's say, uh, say the array is minus two, plus one, zero, plus two. Let's let's say it was that. You could say, if you draw, okay, coins. That's your first one, right? So then, okay, this is a uh, body, right? Coins is body. So great. That's you do it in order, right? Uh, you could also do dr draw the reflective. So they're kind of hard to see on the thing. Um, so, but that's super random, right? So random stats might not be exactly what we want. Um, we could draw a bunch of them and then count them up. But then that, that runs the risk of being very, and, and treat the, the big ones like wild cards, right? So because they draw 16 cards, let's, let's do this, let's draw 16. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Now I could just end up with like a plus eight in something, right? So I have a uh, temperance, which is a wild card. I have a pentacle, a wand, a cup. I have another wand. I have another pentacle. I have a sword. Like these, this is gonna be too much, right? Cause I'm gonna end up with like massive stat boosts somewhere. Um, we just need a way to like determine the character stats. I mean, we could be overcomplicating this. This could just be like, you just choose. So yeah, an array puts bounds on the random the random thing. So you have returned. If we do like a draw four in order. Hey KGX, welcome. Uh you draw four in order, it's like, okay, my plus two is coins, my plus one is wands, my Okay, I could do anything for my zero, but then I it's I guess or you just hmm. Yeah, see I don't I don't know. It's I don't want character this this doesn't super matter. Your stats like they're important, but like it's it's not I don't want it to be a huge focus. I don't want people to spend a ton of time doing this. Um But it does it does indicate the things you're going to accomplish in your in your game there's four stats mind heart body and soul now if we change the core resolution mechanism and make these like a d6 right or if we start at uh at like they all started a, a minus um yeah i i i so here's another thing that i i refuse to do in this game um, sorting the deck at all, which is part of why I wanted to cut out the idea of only having the major arcana. I never want your deck to be anything but the way that it would be used in a tarot reading. So having to separate out certain cards or like look for particular, like you could search the deck. That's one thing, but I don't want to, I don't want to split it. I don't want to be like, put all your coins in one pile and put all your cups in another pile. Um, so yeah.
Okay, so this this how how we do this is still a mystery. Um, well, let's all right. Let's test a let's test a couple of models, right? So, if you say every card in an array gives you plus one to an attribute, how many do we draw? If we want it to be between, and if we want someone to start with a minus, how do we? How do we do that? Do we start, everything starts at minus three and you get 16 cards? Right? Do we, do we say, do we make, do we make sets that you, you draw and choose one of based on the prevailing elements? Oh, that's no, that's a good idea. Okay, so here's here's a thought. Um, some elements are more stable than others. Some are chaotic. The arrays can be tied to that idea, and we can do attunement first. So the arrays can be minus three. Zero, zero, plus three, right? I mean, this is just an example. Uh, they could be uh, plus one, plus one, plus two, minus one. You know, like we can have we can have this this variety, and then this is the fire array, right? This one is the the earth array, um, and then yeah, like more or less unstable, right? Plus two. I guess we gotta figure out what the total is. Are these, do we do we even these out to zero? What is it for Apocalypse World? It's like um, plus, plus one total? Fire, earth, water, air. Plus one is the median. Okay, so we want these to even out to plus one. So minus three, plus one, zero, plus three. That's like very extreme. Um, Plus two, or plus one, zero, minus one, zero. <laughs> like this, this feels like a universally worse one, but then that minus three is so bad. Um, water, uh, I guess, and then the other one with void is like something else. It would have its own rules because it's special. Void's a big cheater. Void is always a big cheater. Uh, yes, this one evens up to zero. So just two plus ones. Uh, yeah, one plus one, zero minus one. Yep, that's right. Okay. Uh, water. Right, but there's five stats in Apocalypse World. Um, so water, let's do some twos in water. Plus two, minus two, zero, plus one, like that. And then air plus two minus one minus one plus one something like that so the idea here would be like you draw uh draw three cards right your character's past your character's present and your character's future and you look for elemental attunements so for example i drew the high priestess i need some elements here I do the lovers. Why do I keep getting major arcana? Ah, I got the empress. Okay, so I guess this would be a wild card. Maybe I can choose. What happens? So that's that's the edge case because only only the suits are uh, elementally aligned. So if you have no, but the thing is, I don't know what the. I don't know what the the like setup is here for. I don't want there to be too many voids. I want void to be rare. Um, let me see. Okay, I got a knight of swords. I got three of wands. I got a one of pentacles. Okay, so we're we're not ending up in. Like this, the, the testing here is not showing us the pattern that we need because this is a sword, a wand, and a pentacle. So I guess I can choose. It gives you, it narrows your choices down maybe. Uh, let me try another reading. So star, temperance, 
okay, this character is a sword, right? I got the, the eight of swords. Uh, oh, you could break it by the highest number. That's actually not bad. So in this case, um, I have a knight, a three, and a four. So it's the knight. So this character is of swords. I think it's more fun to draw a couple of cards and do do that together because you're doing like a bit of a reading, right? Um, no, knights knights are just they're just one. There is a knight in every in every set. Um, yes, if you pull all yeah all the major arcana count as void, um, but then if you draw one major arcana, you are void because they end up in they end up in like they're they're all quite high numbers, right? Like I just drew the king of cups, which is what like a an eleven. Uh, I drew eight of wands, eight of wands, fish king, but I also drew the devil and the devil is 15. So void, right? Even drawing a single major arcana makes you a void. Um, so only void. I like the idea of maybe if only if me, all three are major arcana. Queen of Cups, Five of Wands, and the World, which means this character is water, right? Because the Queen is better than the Five. Yes. Okay. I kind of like that. Let's let's go with that for now. Um, and Void is ch choose, but it has to end up plus one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, only... No, but I want I want them to be super rare. I want void... Because you don't want to be void. People will be able to know. Horoscope tells that you're void. I like that, that it's it's super rare to draw uh, all three, even though I just did it. Um, you ignore them otherwise, I think. Okay, so let's, let's try that. So... We'll do attunement first. And then your attunement will give you an XP trigger. And these are loose, right? These are like blades XP triggers, not like uh, Dungeon World XP triggers. So these are, let's see. Um, well, you within the minus three to plus three range, obviously. Wah, Renegade. So if you want, I guess if you want a plus three, you end up being fire. No, you can do like minus two, minus one instead of a minus three. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, without getting too mathy, right? Like I don't want it to be like doing math. I want it to be more like doing a tarot reading. So you draw three cards. Let's do it one more time. Let's, let's pretend we're making a character. Yeah, minus three, minus three, plus three, plus three. Exactly. You are messed up. All right, I got a five of swords. I got, oh, this guy's a sword for sure. I got a knight of swords. And I got a five of cups. Okay, second character. I got a six of pentacles. Ah. I got a high priestess, which we can ignore. And I got an Ace of Cups. So that makes me a pentacle or a coin in this case. All right. I got Lovers. I got the Queen of Wands. I'm probably going to be a wand. And I got the Empress. Yeah, I'm a wand. Okay. Yeah, I like this. This, this, is, this, is, this is good. I like this. Okay. Uh, good. So let me make a note how that works. Um, the stats aren't coin, cup, sword, and wand because this is the embodiment of those things, right? So there are three things that are connected. The elements, the fates of the tarot, like the suits of the tarot, and a person's being, right? It's an as above, so below situation. Um, how do you break a tie? That's a good question. Um, break a tie, uh, you choose. 
So the idea here is that uh, heaven, heaven above, gives us the suits. The earth around us interprets the suits by the elements. We are born with our attributes, right? So that's how that works. Okay, uh, so we do attunement first. Draw three cards. Uh, looking at number and suit. Ignore major arcana unless the reading is entirely them. Uh, whichever card has the highest value, that is your attunement and array. I'm going to just call these signs. It's not attunement. It, they're like zodiac signs. That is your sign um, and array. If you draw three major arcana, you are born under the sign of the void and are free to choose your stats because heaven has no plan for you. You're heaven's forgotten children. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I like it. Okay, uh, perfect. It's a good start. Okay, uh, so that determines that, and then you assign those to your stats. Uh, your character, uh, your character's stats are mind, heart, body, and soul, and... The way these, I, I would describe these, are uh, thought, observation, um, reasoning, and um, like cleverness, right? Things you do with your brain in the, the traditional like sense. That, that's what this is dictated by. Uh, heart is feelings, empathy, emotion, uh, emotional energy, connection, to others, manipulation, social shit, and also your feels. Uh, okay, and then your body is body stuff, speed, agility, brawn, etc. Yeah, instinct and intuition. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm not gonna give like a, a total like list of all of these, but yeah, that's what it's about. You got you it. You have returned. Hey, Alistair, welcome back. Um. Cool. Okay, so it's like all your body stuff, uh, and then your soul magic. The power of the fountain, the bonds of the Mara, uh, inner light stuff, etc. Right? Magical shit. The ephemeral. Um, so there you go. Uh, can non-magicians use magic? No, you have to have a skill to do so. You have to have um, mysticism, uh, which means you're a magician. Willpower, uh, yeah, maybe that falls under soul. The The reason why I want these to be kind of loose is that it's it's up to the player, like in Blades, it's up to the player to express... Oh no! You don't want you don't want your dump stat to be uh, soul because then uh, you're um, yeah resisting magic, resisting influence. It's not just about it's about how how powerful your soul is. It's enlightenment, right? Yeah, your your GM will will fuck with you if you have a low soul, right? Because a demon trying to corrupt you, um, someone trying to to like break you down magically, you would resist it with your soul. So, yeah, it's important. Um, and that stuff goes into, like, GM protocols, right? Saying, like, threaten the soul. That's something the Mara do, for sure. Uh, cool. Okay. So, body and soul for the real power gamer. That's right. Fuck the heart and mind. <laughs> um, so, your kin, 
I think... I think that this predominantly dictates narrative stuff. Can you see in the dark? Um, you know, how do people react to you? Uh, what is your place in the world? What languages do you speak? Maybe. Um, can you fly? Uh, those sorts of things. Um, I don't know what mechanical stuff I want for Kin, if anything. Because this is just like biology, what you're what you're made out of. Yeah, fictional positioning. Fictional positioning is kin. Um, culture. Same deal. I think it's fictional. I think kin and culture are both fictional positioning. Because I don't think I think they just give you an excuse to roll or an excuse to just have things. They're like tags on your character. Remember, I want this to be a micro RPG. I want to give the players lots of room to make these decisions. I'm not designing a 400 page game here. I'm designing a zine sized game. If that. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think kin culture and profession are all... What do I define as a micro RPG? I don't know, just a small RPG. It's it's a buzzword. It doesn't mean anything. Um, that's it. No, no, I'm not. I'm not giving them more tags. I'm not defining them any better than that. You're a human. What does that mean? I, I don't know. You're you're the baseline. Um, we we are humans, and we perceive fiction through humanity. And we look at how dwarves, Tianxi, birdmen, Mogwai, Naga, the elemental touched, and ogres deviate from our humanity because we're human as an audience. The world, human means you're not everything else. Human means privilege. Human means you're on top because there's so fucking many of you. Yeah, there's no additional tags for this stuff. This is just, what are you? Why would anyone want to be human? Uh, no one will ever judge you for your race. You'll never go to a bar that's like, ah, we don't want your kind here. Uh, you belong everywhere in the world. Um, no one will ever, no one will ever dictate uh, to you based on your species. Um, the other things give you fictional positioning. If you're a Tianxi, you can intimidate people using that. You can spout uh, effluvia about heaven and people will believe you. Uh, if you're a Mogwai, probably you can see in the dark. Uh, maybe you're, uh, when you need to make a move that is, uh, you're, you're under, uh, underappreciated. Uh, maybe you, you know, like this is, this is just basically saying, yeah, they're, they're basically just goblins, um, et cetera, et cetera. So they are, and we'll, we'll say a little bit about what each thing is in the world to give players the idea. Uh, this isn't like Dungeon World where I'm a, I'm a Naga. I get to decide what that is. Um, I'm going to tell you as a player, this is what these things are. So I'll make, in a final version, uh, I, would, I would additionally like expand on this. So like expand on what each thing is with a few sentences. right? What they are and, and where they belong in the world. Uh, culture, same jam, right? Like if you want to be like, of course I know how to find a bar where I can bring my Naga friend. I'm from an urban culture. Um, Unknown Armies does this. Unknown Armies does this thing uh, where... Are we still, do we still want to talk about the humans as default thing? So the reason why the humans are the defaults in this is because we are we are human. Uh, it, it the the culture of the game is built up around the humans being the most populous. It's a it's a statement about privilege, right? 
humans are the the sort of white men of the world, though there aren't any white people in this world. But it's it's a way for us to explore that as a thing. Tianxi are better than humans, but there are so few of them they don't get to leverage their uh, their their stuff. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's a thing. <laughs>